How would a delay of the season affect the Red Sox punishment now that the commissioner has said he will not release any ruling till the season start? And that's a good question because everything that's going on with the Boston Red Sox right now, we don't know what is going to what the commissioner has decided on how he wants to uh, attack the situation with the stuff coming out from uh, over the last couple of years of the Red Sox possibly cheating and using the same tools the Astros did. And possibly more. And possibly more. The same way the Astros did the last couple of years and, and why they won their World Series championship in 2017. So uh, it's, it's an interesting story, and I'm very surprised now that there's nothing going on in sports. Why... Uh, the commissioner has not released anything on his ruling with the Red Sox. Obviously, I think it's bad. That's what I think. And if he releases it now, it's gonna it's gonna really shun the the Boston Red Sox. It really is. It's gonna put a big hex on their season. Even though I do believe the Red Sox are not gonna be any good this year. I really don't think they are. They have Chris Sale that's gonna be out for the rest of the season uh, with uh, his UCL uh, tear. So he's he has to have Tommy John surgery. This team, this pitching staff, there is no pitching staff. They traded away David Price. They traded away one of their their great player and Mookie Betts to the Dodgers. So they're rebuilding. Yes, they got some good prospects now. They br- they have Devers. They brought in the kid that they traded for Mookie Betts, who's the number one Pretty prospect. Good, yeah. Yep, the number one prospect in baseball. So yes, there are good things about what we've seen. The Red Sox are trying to do rebuild their farm system, rebuild this team to what 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 the Yankees are right now. What the uh, the Angels are trying to do right now. All these teams are starting to transition, bringing in their young players like the Chicago White Sox, like even Detroit is trying to do right now, trying to get rid of their old players and rebuild their farm system. That's the way of the league now. The league is now not over. They don't want to overpay these free agents anymore, and I think that's going to change as the years go by too because I do believe after seeing – uh, um, Garrett Cole getting what he got from the New York Yankees, the $325 million. I don't think you're ever going to see a contract like that for a starting pitcher again. And it's interesting baseball. with the shortened season, too, because there's going to be a lot more rotations. There's going to be a lot more openers. And those teams are going to be tested into that theory. And if teams start succeeding off of that and knowing how to overcome maybe issues with starting pitching or issues, again, with not being able to bring it in, bring in free agents, then you're going to see a lot of that more often too. And it definitely could be the new wave of the league when it comes to player development. And a lot of those middle and smaller market teams have really shifted that way of thinking too. And the two guys we had on today, both Roxy Bernstein and Andrew Free, both have teams that are operating those kinds of money ball like I think the two, I think doing the, it very well. I think the two best organizations, I believe, the two best organizations with the least amount of money that are working with the least amount of stuff – and two organizations in the last 10 years that have been playoff contending teams in the A's and the Tampa Bay Rays. And why not have both broadcasters, both play-by-play guys on the same show talking about the same thing? And really, both interviews were so really perfect in every kind of way from going from one sport to the other with Roxy Bernstein, him giving us the inside of the A's and what baseball is doing and his thoughts of Rob Manford and how he made a mistake, how he dropped the ball with the whole uh, Houston Astros thing. And the same thing with Andrew Free. He gave us an insight with the Astros. We didn't even, we didn't even have to bring up the Astros. He gave us the insight on why he thought that the Astros should have been uh, hit even worse than what they had by the the commission of Rob Manford. And so he, he brought up a point that was great too. He sh- they should be forced to hire within and it makes a lot of sense. Why should they be able to take a top guy from the Rays organization like that too? He's absolutely right. Well, again, he he comes from the Rays organization, so his opinions towards uh backing up the Rays and where the Rays are as an organization. Why would you want one of your best executives taken away from your team because your exec- your executive got fired because he was cheating. Right. So and the nobody Red Sox did the same thing now. Yeah, with, nobody with, wants to see that. Nobody wants to see that. And and I do believe that that's why he's upset about it. And I'm upset about it as a as a Yankee fan because if it was the Yankees or even the Red Sox, I think the the Red Sox are going to be slammed even harder than the Astros did I think because they could be too if they use the whole replay room. Yeah, <laughs> that's so more technology. I, I do believe the reason why Rob Manfred is not coming out with anything is because it is bad and he is going to hit the Red Sox pretty bad. And this would be a big story. And the Red Sox are one of the big teams right. Right now in the major leagues, one of the most popular teams in the major leagues. And if this comes out, it could really
really put a not only a hex of where the season is right now because we don't even know if we're going to have a season. Right. But now that's the top story. It was the Astros. It's died down. The Astros story is dying down, and everybody is looking forward to hearing what he has found out with this whole investigation with the Boston Red Sox. I want to know what he's figured out and found out with the Red Sox organization because it must have been really, really big because Alex Cora got fired. So, and I, I don't think it had anything to do with the Astros on why Alex Cora got fired. I think it has a lot more in depth uh, behind the Red Sox situation than we even know. And I think we're going to find out when season when the season starts. Well, so. Cora is the mutual to every uh, to both sides. But again, you well, also so was Beltran. They said Beltran was the mastermind of doing what they right, did. But on the Beltran bench. wasn't that no, he was a Red player. Sox, but still. No, he was, he was a player on the Astros. I know. I'm just saying. I'm saying with the Red but Sox. But he was a mastermind. How did Alex Cora learn that? He learned no, it from Beltran. No, it's possible. But still, the Red Sox are also again just one of the richest organizations where they can spend more on that on that technology if they had it available. Maybe they had a second replay room that nobody knows about if they indeed use the replay room to do that. And also, you're dealing with more parts on the field too, where you can get camera angles from different spots too. There's a lot of technology in there that allows you to do it between audio and video to be able to enhance it even further. And if they indeed use the entirety of the replay room and had more executives that weren't maybe part of the team or part of the game do it they could be hit harder for sure if it's the same maybe it's a comparative thing they might again they might give them the same punishment we'll see but again this could be definitely worse this whole virtual nfl draft has really transitioned what we might do in the future and what the league and some of these GMs and owners might decide to do. I understand the NFL is trying to raise money. And 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 and, and they, they, they're trying to make money. I'm not raise money. They're trying to make money. And with the NFL draft and what the NFL draft does, not only for some of these young players that have the opportunity to go on stage, meet Roger Goodell, shake Roger Goodell's hand and hug him and lift up his his new jersey, his new team that he's going to be playing for for the next five years is something that these players absolutely want to have the opportunity of doing. But if they can somehow perfect this virtual NFL draft, just like they did with the WNBA, which I thought was very successful, it was very successful. I think it was, was it Friday night? Or, or I think Friday, yeah. It was Friday or Thursday night, if I'm not mistaken. And it was very successful, the way they did it. The WNBA did it. Uh, it worked. And it worked to exactly what you know the WNBA wanted to do, how they wanted to bring it out to the fan and for the fan to absolutely tune in and, and watch how the draft and, and where the draft uh, winded up going. But the NFL is completely different. There is round after round after round. There's seven rounds in the NFL. With the WNBA, it's only one round, and that's it. So it's going to be very interesting how the NFL and and some of these executives of these organizations, like the Dallas Cowboys, the New York Jets, the New York Giants, how they're going to interact with each other virtually before they make the decision on who they want to draft. Now... Does this change the game this season or change uh, a team's plan this season or for the future? I think for both. Because if this works out very well, I think the NFL might look to do this not even not just this year, maybe next year really? with everything that's going on with COVID-19. We don't know how this is going to be fixed in in the next year. There might be more problems ahead of us before we get a serum to stop COVID-19. Where they're not going to want to have these uh, events like the NFL draft when there's no need for it. And have a bunch a bunch of people, uh, like thousands and thousands of people in the audience just watching a bunch of players go on a stage, raise up a jersey, and, and kiss Roger Goodell on the cheek. I mean, that's, that's my argument with this. And, and I, I, I swear... As a fan, as a sports fan, you can't be very excited about what you're looking forward to on Thursday night because you don't know what to expect. Now, the WNBA is completely different. And yes, the NFL is a multi-billion dollar industry, one of the biggest organizations in professional sports and throughout the country in any organization. Last year, the NFL made $18.6 billion. That's endorsements and everything. 
Everything rolled up in one. In just the Super Bowl, they made close to a, I would say about three, four hundred million dollars just of endorsements just off of one game. But the NFL, just like every organization, is going to try to find a way to protect the players. That's what they're going to do. Protect the players, protect the executives, the owners, even the league. Now, I do believe this is going to change everything. It's going to change this season. Absolutely. And anybody, oh, yeah. anybody that doesn't think that this draft is going to change everything for a lot of teams this season, because one team might have one step up on all the other teams on how they're going to draft and how they're going to use this virtual draft to benefit them. Right. And other teams are not to, they're not going to know what to expect. They're going to jump in this expecting the unexpected. Right. And it's in- interesting because of what philosophies you're going to go by. Obviously there's some new school teams that are using the analytics, using the technology to scout out these players that might think they have an advantage just by watching the tape and, maybe scouting them without having to do too much in terms of workouts because obviously a lot of pro days were canceled and stuff like that. But again, it'll be interesting to see also if they end up drafting him and how they're going to end up working him out later because when his training camp is going to open, will there be – there's not going to be any rookie mini camps most likely that they usually have in May either. So – Will that stop people from drafting maybe more project players or players that aren't as refined yet? And might we see more safe picks as a result of that too is going to be very interesting. I I don't know what a safe pick is because you're expecting these players to step into the NFL with a bunch of men. And when I say men, most of these men are in in the middle age, NFL middle age is like 27, 28. So they're still kids. Sure. But they're stepping – in with guys that are twice the size of them coming out of college or twice as fast as them as far as understanding how to make the plays, how to call the plays, or how to align to to make the plays in the middle of the field defensively or offensively. So it's going to take a little while for these young NCAA, NCAA players coming out of college to figure out the speed of the game and understanding how to be position in position, knowing that there's not going to be practices. There's not going to be really off the field OTAs really. Right. So it's going to be it's going to be a work in progress not only for some of these teams but some of these players that they're going to have to do this on their own right. which is going to be something unique that we haven't seen before. I think I'm what I'm saying is I'm more referring to the prospects that we know what they are but maybe they don't have as much upside like they are what they are and they're great already versus a player that maybe has if they get enough moves if it's you're a pass rusher like if you receivers, different types of catches, different types of routes, maybe those players will end up falling as a result of this, and maybe teams will be safer as a result, rather than maybe gambling on somebody later in the first round or middle in the first round that maybe has the upside, but either has injury issues or is raw or something like that, I think is more of what I was referring to. Well, you refer to a lot of things, and sometimes I wonder and shake my head when you talk, but I I will say this. When you look at the NFL and you look at this virtual draft that they're trying to implicate right now, because and I, I, I watched a documentary on ESPN the other day where these players were getting, and I, I wouldn't say it was a documentary, it was like a 10, 15 minute thing that the ESPN had where they were sending all the different um, virtual things they kind of have to set up in their house so they can keep up on when if they're going to get a phone call from a team or an organization are are the cameras going to be placed where he's going to be sitting on his sofa they got to set this up and with the whole covid-19 you're not going to be setting all these sending out all these technical guys to set up all their cameras and their audio stuff for these players to be ready to be drafted so these players are going to have to figure that out as well so i think it's to me it's a stage where we don't know how this is going to work out with some of these players and some of these teams and some of these uh, families that are going to be there trying to represent uh, the player that's getting drafted.